feeling. It's about what you feel. So that romanticism was, I mean, one of my favorite poems is, is Coleridge's uh, Him Before Sunrise in the Vale of Chamonix. I mean, basically, he's, he's just experiencing the sun rising above Mont Blanc in the Alps, and it becomes a hymn of praise. To God. That's a bit later than lyrical ballads, because it's lyrical ballads, neither of them are Christian at this point. They won the path. So this is actually, although they didn't know it in this way, it was actually a restoration of a, a, a Catholic, Thomistic understanding of perception. You read the Summa, the way that we perceive reality, you have to begin, as with all things, with virtue. Right? Without virtue, you will not perceive reality. In other words, that the humility opens the eyes and, and, and pride shuts them. And just like that other great expression that he never said, but you do see it emblazoned on t-shirts, um, and I like it a lot, um, which is um, a government big enough to give you um, everything you want is large enough to take away everything you have. <laughs> <laughs> now Michael Cashman led the weapon. The European um, Parliament's veto against Rocco Bottiglione. Rocco Bottiglione was a, is a philosopher. I think rector of the Catholic University of Liechtenstein, um, friend of JP2, helped write a number of um, encyclicals. Uh, but I want to say he's like a, a mainstream Christian Democrat. Could you spell that name, please? Thank you. <laughs> As Ferdy said, Robert Hugh Benson and John Gray were two of the most famous Catholic priests in Britain at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. They knew each other since Benson used to attend the Salon of Mark Andrei Rafalovich in Edinburgh, the latter Gray's neighbor and uh, his best friend. Very different in their attitudes and character, however, Benson and Gray share a deep passion for literature. To them we owe in particular two novels, between dystopia and utopia, which testify the depth of their faith, their love for priesthood, and above all, their attachment to the church. He, he was a great friend of Bernard Shaw, and he says, I know what Bernard Shaw will be writing in 20 years time, because it's the same thing he's writing now. <laughs> and he also wrote, when writing of Dickens, he was a great fancier of Dickens, he said, uh, Dickens is, is uh, Dickens' book is just one piece of a huge roll of cloth called Dickens, and every piece of that cloth will be almost the same. Now he wasn't criticizing that; he was saying, "You know what? You know what Dickens' message is." And Chesterton's like that. You you know what you're going to get. He doesn't change his views from from one year to the next. He he has a fixed vision of things. This must, therefore, include legislators themselves when they are creating new law. If the highest legislative power in a state, whether it be made up of one person or many, can enact whatever it fancies without any limits, where then is the rule of law. In the end, it is a solid grasp on where we have come from, who we are, and where we are going, that will enable us to face the future with confidence, and not fall into that trap of throwing the town and joining the forces of darkness, or becoming sad and desperate soldiers hoping to die in the front line. Whether we subscribe to the 22-year cycles of Strauss and Howe, or just to some process of action and reaction to the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It need not make us feel that man is somehow trapped in a predetermined cycle. Man is a part of creation, and like the tides or the seasons, his life is rooted in cycles of change and decay, of death and rebirth. To understand that and accept it ought to be liberating. How we choose to live within those cycles is what matters. And for us, who have an eye both on the church and the world, and perhaps sometimes feel that things have got rather bad, so bad perhaps as to be irreparable. It should be some consolation to know that it is only when it has gone right out to sea, and that is, as at its lowest ebb, that the, 
the tide eventually turns. And then when it does, no one can stop it. We need to be like good surfers, wait, waiting for the big wave. Let us now try to position ourselves so as to ride the turning tide and get the most out of the next high when it comes. To survive the end of this current, current age, one needs to hold on only to what really endures, and then just look forward to the next one. Thank you. Is um, Tolkien, someone wrote Tolkien once and said, uh, is the Lord of the Rings an allegory of atomic power? And Tolkien replied, dear madam, no, yours sincerely, J. R. <laughs> <laughs> And he did do that, but he elaborated. He said, no, it's not, a, it's not a, an allegory of atomic power. But he says it is an allegory of power, particularly power usurped for domination. They actually very much fits in with the talk this morning. Power is usurped, it's not rightly the, the, uh, uh, the right of the person ruled again. Um, but he said, but more than that, it's an allegory of death and immortality. So that's important. If Tolkien says basically that the most important aspect of the allegorical dimension is death and immortality, we've got to look at that. And of course that makes the elves an important part of the Lord of the Rings, because the elves are the immortal ones, the ones that don't die. But what does that mean? I mean, because the whole of alchemy and scientism now, in the Middle, middle Ages, magic, uh, alchemy, and so-called science, um, was, was obsessed with two things. How to turn base meth into gold. In other words, how to become stinking rich. And how to find the elixir of life. How to live forever. And, by the way, 90% of scientific research today is, is also spent with exactly those two things. <laughs> how to make loads and loads of money, and how to live forever. So, talk, so Tolkien is, uh, is actually touching something very, very important here. Because he's saying, well, what happens if you live forever? The elves live forever, and men don't. So it's the comparison between the two, the mortals and the immortals. So Galadriel says that she and her husband have fought the long defeat for ages of the world, by which we talk about millennia. They live for a thousand, a thousand ever. And what does that mean? Well, in the fallen cosmos, a cosmos where sin and its consequences are part of the very fabric of the thing itself, evil cannot be destroyed. You fight it, but it keeps coming back like a fungus over and over and over again, every generation. So the battle against evil is an ongoing one till the end of time. Towards the end of the lecture, Pope Benedict quotes from Socrates, who's addressing Fido, on someone who becomes so annoyed at all the false notions that he hears that he no longer believes it possible to distinguish any existential truth. Immediately before that passage that Pope Benedict quotes, we read there also, You know how those in particular who spend their time studying contradiction and in the end believe themselves to become very wise, that they alone have understood that there is no soundness or reliability in any object or argument, but all that exists simply fluctuates up or down. So already in 90 BC, we have the description of modern relativism that Pope Benedict sees as basic to the intellectual disorders of our public life. No.